you know what I like about you, Yuri, Yuriv, is um, I mean, you you really have this very peaceful presence. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> I, I think that I've always had that, but underneath uh, there's more going on than people realize. Mm -hmm. um, or let's say less, less peace. <laughs> right. Um, Sometimes, not always. So, yeah, so we, we should do an introduction. Um, and this is already, we'll just keep all of this because this is great. This is gold. Podcasting gold, you read. And um, all the best ones start with no warning. And <laughs> But, but to give an official introduction, um, my name is Art Pinsoff. Your name is Yuriv. How do you pronounce your last name? Eris. Eris. Yuriv Eris. This is a podcast um, called Ocean to Ocean that most people are going to see on YouTube, distributed by Nothing Media. And... Yeah, which is a YouTube channel with conversations with people who like to talk about nothing for the most part. And, and it has a lot of interviews with, um, you know, people who are watching this have seen interviews with Andreas Mueller, Tony Parsons. They may have seen my recent interview with Walter in the Netherlands. And this whole cornucopia of characters that each have their own stories and backgrounds and seem to have a common thread of having been really intense seekers at some point and then at some other point that sense dropping away and and then the everyone sort of has their own way of expressing what that no longer being a seeker and yeah so yeah, so that's, I think that's a, gives a little context to what we're doing here, but we could really talk about anything, like my shaving, like me shaving my beard two nights ago. <laughs> <laughs> what actually led you to do that? Um, I felt pretty bold at the time. I mean, pretty, yeah, I, most of the people watching and listening won't know that I have some injuries. So I, this arm, I just can't use for anything, basically. So having only one arm, it's, um, you know, it's actually like, I, there's this short, there's this um, short story fiction author who I really love. Oh, gosh, I forget. His name is Edgar, Ed, I think it's Edgar Carrot, something like that. He's a he's an Israeli fiction author who's brilliant, and um, and one of his collections of short stories starts with um, this story about someone with asthma, with very severe asthma, and that how to someone who deals with asthma every day, the I like the sense of, and I feel like this is going to tie in nicely with everything else, but the the, the sense of what you say. Um, you feel you feel the economy of it you you feel because because you know what it is to only have enough breath for a certain amount of sound to come out you know you know what i mean so with regard to my hand you know i I've, I've been dealing with you know these injuries for well the wrist injury for a couple months now basically and so the reason why i didn't shave for three months, probably the longest I haven't shaved in a long time, um, was because I have to be very conscious of what I use this hand for. And so any like shaving takes like 40 minutes for me, basically. So 
at least. So I, when it gets that long, especially, so I can't really, yeah. So that's basically, I felt like I had the strength and stamina to do it. And I wanted to just, you know, give it a go and see if it caused any problems and it didn't, it was fine. Other than a little razor burn, which I don't know how to get rid of, but, <laughs> but yeah. And, 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 but the reason why I feel like this could tie in is because I get this sense from you of a real felt sense of economy of language. You know, you don't like, you know, we were in, um, we were in my meeting an hour ago for two hours and you are someone that when you do speak, I feel, I, I you know, I'm always listening to every word you say. Thank you. Because I feel the space around the words. You're not, you're, one of, you're not one of those people who's always just trying to jump in to say something. So when you do speak, I really want to hear it. Thank you. Yeah. I think a lot of times people talk and there's, there's, I've, I've never really been into small talk. It's, it's never been something that I was fascinated by. I, I know that there's a lot of value to it actually for people just connecting and talking about the weather and how are your kids and what did you do last night? Um, it doesn't really interest me usually, to be honest, and I kind of gloss over. Uh, but when it's something that interests me, I do listen. Uh, um, and I, I do try to, to talk about things that, that I find interesting, mm. uh, that I, I connect with. Um, and... Um, it, it just seems more in line with my character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't like the bullshit. Or maybe that's putting, some, that, that has a different flavor to it. But you're, you're not like a, what, yeah, no, that, that sort of brings to mind, um, you know, being brutally honest. And that's not necessarily what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just, I just prefer to, to, um, <clears throat> um, I don't know, use the time well. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, of course, since uh, everyone listening is into, or maybe into non-duality, I'm sure all kinds of red flags are going to come up for people <laughs> about time and oh. that. Yeah, um, the non-dual police are taking this. <laughs> yes. Well, I, 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 um, I mean, I, I, I'm not someone who uh, is um, uh, sort of iconoclastic by nature. So I'm not going to try to knock down um, uh, any any concepts, uh, but I think it's it's always good to be honest. Yeah. And um, and when you know I I don't feel it, uh, then be honest about it. Yeah. Yeah, instead of, you know, just repeating some catchphrase. Sure. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking to a, a, a traditional Advaita teacher the other night, just having a private conversation. Um, and at one point he was, he was being, you know, critical of the sort of um, radical non-dual message. Um, you know, which I can also be, you know, I, I could sort of see both sides of a lot of these um, are, you know, conversations. I wouldn't even call it an argument, but 
Um, but, you know, you know, I guess to play devil's advocate against what he was saying, I, I said, well, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of like the Beatles, you know, it's like these songs are just good. So it doesn't, so, for, so to hear the same song, um, you don't want to hear a different version necessarily of that, be that song that you love, you know? So that, so, I mean, that's one way, because he asked me if I'd spoken to Tony Parsons on the phone. And I said, yes, I called him once, but then realized I have a horrible international plan and I'm never going to be able to call him again. Like, <laughs> so anyone in Europe or England, you know, if you, if you want to talk to the guy, he has his phone number on his website. He's very sweet. And there's two hours every day where he makes himself available for conversation. And that's, that's a really nice, generous thing for him to do. And, but I talked to him for 10 minutes, and in that 10 minutes, I think more than 10 times, he said the phrase, um, this is no thing apparently happening. And, and so this Advaita teacher I was talking to, you know, was sort of, you know, I guess, poo-pooing that a little bit and saying, yeah, it's just repetitive. And I said, yeah, but it's like a song you love, you know, it's like, if it's good, it's good. And you don't necessarily need to change it. And when I heard him saying this, you know, there part of me was like, okay, is this really, you know, how, long, how much longer does this call need to be if he's just gonna repeat this? And yet when he said it, he would laugh and I would laugh and there was kind of like a gentle sweetness to how he said it. And it was also like a pointing you back, no matter what we talked about, that's just what he, in that conversation, I know he, you know, I'm sure he has many sides to him as a personality, as a non-existent personality or whatever. <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah, yeah, I heard, um, yeah, so to me, it was just kind of like, okay, this is his song and it's a nice song, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And for some people that's enough. For them, pe some people, they don't even need that, you know? Some people would never, watch more than like a minute of a video like this and be like oh they're gonna try to talk about nothing and they just turn off <laughs> Go into it. i i have friends who are like that who, who actually a friend of mine who introduced me to all of this more or less he introduced me to ramana maharshi which got me on this track and um he he, he lost all interest in ever talking about it even to me or to anyone you know and that's just his, that you might say that's just his personality or there was somebody, somebody in our group today who um, hadn't been in there for a little while. And for those who don't know, I host a bi-weekly group of just an open discussion about this um, where pretty much anyone is welcome. Um, and yeah, but there's someone who said he stopped coming to my meeting and all meetings because he saw no point. And that's totally fine. And, 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 and not incorrect either. No, no, not. No, it might be the most correct. I mean, I don't know if there's more or less correct, but if there is, that might be a step above the one who's always showing up. <laughs> and wants to get something out of them. It, Exactly, because they're <laughs> pretty good thinking. Yeah, yeah. That's... So, so, so maybe this is a good um, jump-off point to go into the story of Yariv. Is does the, is this the story of Yariv, someone who used to go to places and and do practices to try to get something out of it, and then that fell away, or got less and less over time. Or, or let me give another option here, or did you just stop worrying about if that was the case or not? I'm like, oh, I enjoy this, no big deal. Like an okayness with the seeking. I, I think more the latter. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I did things over years, uh, you know, I've, like gone to uh, a guru, even though I wasn't really into the guru, but I was like curious at 18, 
and um, <clears throat> uh, you know meditated and um, went to all kinds of things and then got into non-duality um, and um, <clears throat> got into uh, Byron Katie's uh, inquiry for a period and, um, you know, read some things, some books and had some experiences, all of that stuff. And then there was a long period where I kind of lost interest in all of that um, and just kind of lived my life. Yeah. And um, then um, well, I guess this must be about a year and a half ago or something. Um, my friend Sharon, who you've met mm -hmm. uh, on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, suggested coming to uh, Paul Hederman's meeting and uh, which was in San Francisco and it was you know, convenient and it wasn't a big investment in time. And uh, there were like seven or eight people there. And so it was really small and uh, intimate. And uh, um, <clears throat> um, I, I, like the first couple of months, I had no idea what he was really talking. I couldn't understand him. But um, right. Uh, I mean, I I, <clears throat> I kind of had experience with this stuff, but I just couldn't understand what Paul was saying. Um, yeah. But um, um. I definitely felt uh, that it made a difference in uh, I'm going to use a, a non-duality term. In Don't even worry about this. One. <laughs> Whatever comes to your head, just feel free. <laughs> in the in the in in in, in my my perspective, in, in or or the the apparent person's perspective, or whatever. Sure. Uh, and there was there was a difference. There was uh, this traveling lighter, um, and uh, and then quarantine happened, and so Zoom meetings started to happen, and all these other possibilities. Uh, and I had more time, and uh, and I I do feel that. Uh, it does make a difference um, having this perspective. It's not just um, uh, um, a um, a shift in perspective uh, about reality but it has very tangible results for the character, for the person, Yeah. in my case. Um, yeah. yeah, and I found that a very useful way to look at it. When I, I, I had a similar experience with Paul, where when I first heard him, I, I, his language was very confusing to me because it, it just appeared quite different than other things I'd encountered. And more than anything, that might have been what kept me coming back to his Zoom meetings tr to try to like figure out what's he saying, you know, what, you know. But at a certain point, a few of these things he said really start landed in a way that had a noticeable effect for the character, exactly as you're saying. And 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 one of them is actually this way that he puts things, where he says that um, you know, that you can't use non-duality to solve problems of duality. But something about this perspective does make the character appear to travel lighter. 
Yeah. And, and I remember one of the first metaphors he gave for that was something like if he has a flight to go, you know, somewhere and the flight, you know, has an eight hour layaway somewhere, he's going to try to find another flight with only a two hour layaway, which sounds like really, it, but it, like I, what I like about that example is it's so simple. It's just anything that's uncomfortable, you know, the body just will um, do what it can to be more comfortable when there's less story there, which, yeah, which, which it's interesting because it, it just seems like once you see that or once you experience that, it seems like, oh, this was in front of my face the whole time. It's so simple. Yeah. You know, and, and for me, one of the ways this has appeared is, you know, to just, yeah, well, one way is if somebody's, if there's somebody in my life who causes tension in my body consistently, I'll just put it that way. I'll just, I, I have less of a problem, um, you know, creating distance or having space and not really, you know, I think before there was more attachment to, um, needing to be liked and be a people pleaser and this attracts narcissistic personalities and that's just a whole other story but so but but there so there's more of a space where i'm okay with you know letting things go if they don't feel like they're serving me in a sense yeah 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 i i and you know this thing of <sighs> being um, gentle and th this came up in, in, uh, in, in the meeting before about being gentle and compassionate, uh, including with ourselves. And um, if something doesn't feel right, then maybe do something about it you know, take some distance from a person who um, just causes a lot of tension and drama or get closer to someone that we like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, making, making choices that in some way, and I'm, I'm, this is kind of, I've never, I'm, I'm kind of, talking as I'm, as I'm thinking about it. So uh, sure. bear with me. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if, if this um, perspective, let's, uh, which is not a perspective of this non-dual, right. uh, whatever, uh, in some way it, it, it helps to kind of loosen up uh, this whole personality thing. I wonder about that. I've, I've never thought about that. Um, do you do, do kind of see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, it, yeah, well, there's less second guessing oneself, I think, which it, it's all kind of paradoxical because on the one hand, I mean, it just has to be, it's all paradoxical, but mm -hmm. yeah, but to, to me, this this symbolism of like what before, well, I, I don't believe that it's possible for this mind-body organism to ever exist without a story, you know, somewhere or another appearing. I think to me at this point, that just seems like a fool's errand. And there are some who might think that there's some sort of state where all story would dissolve and I don't even know what they might say, but there would just be a, a constant um, knowing of the non-dual awareness that you would never never leave you and that and your behavior would be guided by knowing that nothing exists and there's no one doing it. To me, that's absurd. To me, <laughs> to me, like what knows that can't be expressed and what is expressed is coming from the body mind, which is something that, you know, is basically programmed by genetics and the conditioning of your environment, which is psychological. And you could, you could attach whatever words you want to it, but I think 
yeah, I guess the bottom line is what I notice is that there's a, you know, what used the store used to be held like very tightly, like, like for me, there used to be this very solid feeling and, you know, mental knowing of I am this, I am, you yeah. know, a musician or I work at this job or I am, but, but the, they weren't just things that the body mind was doing. They, it, there was like a story and a feeling of like an identity there that was solid. And now it's like, whatever I'm doing, it's just what's happening. It's what I'm doing. And I love doing, you know, I'm, I, there's things that I do that I love. There's things that I have to do that I don't enjoy, but, but whatever is happening, it doesn't feel like, I, I don't feel like that's me, you know, cause you know, lately I've just like, when I wake up, I notice, you know, my thoughts appear, all these thoughts start appearing and, and I just sort of look at it and think, Oh, that's interesting. All those thoughts just appear on their own. Like, it's like the, you know, you wake up and then the dominoes start falling. One thing leads to another, leads to another. And, and to me, it's just like the weather blowing leaves or something. It's, you don't need to figure out like, why did that leaf go to the left or the right? It's because it was a left leaf, you know, and that's a right leaf. You know, no, it's just the wind is blowing everything. Like the, you know, this is like one teacher, you know, who I, I liked at one point, um, you know, he said, you know, this is all the big bang banging. Like, like we are the continuation of the big bang right now. This is it. The big bang is still occurring, you know, and just another way to look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, kind of continue to think about what um, I, I said earlier about things kind of expanding and getting less tight. Um, uh, I think that with that um, loosening of, of the identity, uh, uh, there is there is this um, space and 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 ability to to uh, to function uh, um, with more freedom. Uh, and, and, um, and definitely less drama. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I feel like what I was describing earlier is like that sense of identity just felt like inherent drama. It just did. Yeah. It, it's hard to explain why, but I, it was very deeply psychological. It, it felt, it, it came from like a feeling of like not good enough. So I have to be this, you know? And if I'm not that, then I'm not good enough or I'm not that. It, it, it's, this, it's this wiring that we have as humans that's totally normal. There's nothing wrong with it. But, and, and I think even that sort of thing is, to some degree might be inescapable. You know, this isn't about self-help. This isn't about coming to a place where you never feel insecure, you know? <laughs> you know? I think that's just part of being human is to, you know, sometimes you mess up, sometimes you you miss the mark and then you feel embarrassed or, you know, whatever, and life goes on. That's just part of the process of life. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I was thinking about this um, earlier. I, I come from a, uh, I was born on a kibbutz in Israel and people um, believed that they were building a utopian community. Uh, and uh, I think that they had some really wonderful ideas. Yeah. Uh, one thing they, that I think was uh, not really addressed was people's um, personalities, people's emotions. And um, uh, I think that you can have uh, very good ideals, ideals, uh, but if, if, 
there isn't an emotional uh, change if if you're somewhere else emotionally, then it's it's not really going to work, or it's not going to work the way uh, you intended it to work. Uh, I think that that's a more correct way of putting it. Mm. Uh, uh, so it's it's with with because I think that with um, with this understanding that um, that we don't understand, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Watching out those non-dual police, they just. They were like, oh, he said understanding. They were like, oh, okay, he corrected it. He said. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny because I was thinking that too. Yeah. <laughs> I was that too. I was like, you can't understand uh, this. Clearly, this guy doesn't get it. <laughs> Glad I, I passed uh, the test. Yeah. Um, you saved yourself one demerit. One demerit. One demerit. <laughs> Well, there's, there's, I'm, I, 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 uh, I look forward to having uh, some <laughs> that I don't. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to that. These, I don't know, today anyway that the, the, the personality has to be attended to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gotta be looked at, the feelings, the, the emotions, the, the, the needs of the body. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's part of everything. And uh, yeah. It's, it's got to be attended to. Definitely. Yeah, it, it reminds me of how Nisar Gadada said, everything is food coming in the body and going out the body. But he, by that, he meant including thoughts and emotions and the, perhaps the people you surround yourself with and all these factors. It all influences your behavior and your experience in this temporary, you know, spacesuit or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never heard that. Uh, I was really into him for a while, um, but I, I never heard that one. Yeah, it, he, he changed his languaging pretty dramatically um, after I Am That. So there's I Am That, and then there's about, I don't know, six or nine other books that are all somehow mostly take place during the last three years of his life. I Am That was recordings from about 10 to 15 years before he died. So he made a pretty big change in how he spoke towards at the end. And he would even say that he's gone so much further than I Am That, he said that at one point. But um, yeah, which is interesting. I mean, this, and this is, makes me think of another topic, just, you know, we don't have to go into, but you know, the, you know, the advice of teacher Tom Doss, he recently published an article called The Evolution of Tony Parsons Part, part Two, where he, which the part one is very interesting in itself, but in part two, he specifically looks at this one book that Nisargadatta published, in, no, I'm sorry, that Tony Parsons published in 2005, I think, that is now out of print, where Tony at the time was, very much um, using the language of Nisargadatta as far as, you know, he used the word awareness and consciousness in a way that was very specific to how Nisargadatta used those words. Um, and I only bring that up to bring up this point in general, not about Tony, but, you know, Nisargadatta changed his language in 10 years, and so did Tony. And I think there's a freedom in this to not have to, there's no dogma. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. And, and that's kind of like the thing about this talk that we're having. Uh, I, 
you know, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to, to talk because I know that, um, um, like in, in a week or two, I'll, I might listen to it or in two years and I'll, I'll, uh, you know, I'll think, oh, that, that was a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it, and I guess I would hope that there, if it does come to that, which it, it's almost certain to really, you know, it, that, that maybe there's like, a, oh, that's, you know, it's cute. But that's how I thought back then. You know, that's how I said this back then. And, or who knows, I, maybe, maybe it will still sound the same. You just you have no idea. That's I don't. I'm... I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really don't. Speaking of Paul, you know, I mean, Paul, you know, when I started, yeah, attending his meetings and saw that he had a podcast recording his meetings that went back 10 years. Like on YouTube, it goes back maybe two or three or something, maybe five at most. In, in podcast form, he has audio recordings going back over 10 years, I think. And so I just started randomly downloading episodes. And I mean, Paul is actually kind of the opposite of what we're talking about. Like he, his message has stayed surprisingly consistent in the way he says it. There's a, there's a couple metaphors he changes out every few years. He had, a, <laughs> he had a different favorite, like few few metaphors 10 years ago than he does now. But aside from details like that, there, yeah, which there's a beauty to that. I mean, there's a beauty to someone who's always changing, you know, like, makes me think of, you know, like a pop singer who changes their hair and their whole image every album cycle, you know, like David Bowie used to do or Madonna or something, you know? And, and then there's someone who's just, they are what they are, you know? You just, I don't know. Can't think of an example right now, but, you know. Neil Young. Neil Young, yeah, you're right. Neil Young is always Neil Young. He's not gonna change his haircut or whatever, yeah. Yeah, 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 and uh, and what he does is beautiful. Still, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like how certain actors kind of just play themselves, kind of like some movie stars are like that, like Brad Pitt to some degree, and certain people, and then others are like um, character actors where you don't even recognize them in half their roles because they go so deeply into this other character. Yeah. Like Bill Murray is always going to be Bill Murray, you know, but but Daniel Day Lewis, I mean, you could he just fall, he, he disappears into these other characters. Yeah, 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 no, true. Yeah, 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 and again, it's this thing of the character, you know. This is and and you know, some people may may have this idea: oh, you should be consistent. Uh, and someone else might think, no, 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 they're just being repetitive. Like, uh, you know, the guy you were talking to about, uh, Tony Parsons. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, you need to be authentic and fresh and in the moment. And, um, and there's no, no right or wrong, really. There's not uh, a good way to be. Right, exactly. So, yeah, we, maybe now is a good time if if you if you'd like. Um, when you think about, w would you like to share anything about your journey um, through different teachers? Any interesting, you know, moments or you know experiences you, got, you that milestones along the way? Is there any of that you'd like to share? I've done that before once, mm -hmm. so I feel like that was enough. Okay, okay. And, and, and if people want to hear when you did that, was that the podcast that you told me about? Um, yeah. With you and Sharon, what, that was, was that called Dream Talk? Dream, I think it was called Dream Talking, and it was with uh, Nick Bebo, I think is his last name. It starts with a B. I know how to write it, but, uh, I, and it is called Dream Talking. Yeah, Dream Talking, yeah. 
people could find that it was it was a podcast where you and your friend sharing were both yeah 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 so so we talked about that and it was fun because we um uh, we went through a lot of stuff together. We've, we've been friends for uh, uh, many years, uh, 20, 27 years or something. And um, so it was fun to, to kind of recount that on the podcast. And uh, it was kind of like, uh, you know, looking at a family photo album and, you know, going, <laughs> oh, remember that? And... Yeah. You know, remember that, and we had fun, but uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, remember, I don't know if you remember when people used to take slides and, you know, they'd invite you to their house for a slideshow of their trip to Europe, and you'd have to sit there through like an hour of slides, uh, and, um, uh, and it was so boring. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know this is me in front of the uh tower of pizza uh yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh, you know for us it was fun because we were there and it was fun to recall yeah uh these different experiences and they were experiences yeah uh, but, uh, you know, for someone else, well, why would I want to bother and bore anyone with that stuff? <laughs> you know that I, I totally understand. I mean, that's sort of how this is the fourth of these interviews that are being shared, I think, um, that I've done. And, and I've found that, you know, I, I always start, you know, basically, because I've listened to, you know, probably over a hundred of, um, at least of, Rick Archer's podcast over the years, Buddha at the Gas Pump. And he tends to have this structure where the first, there's a first hour where it's this very detailed biography sort of going up to the present. And then the second hour is more just about the philosophy of this person, their ideas, their practices, and then questions and answers from him and listeners about that. And, but what I find with these interviews with um, people like yourself is that it, it's like, to me, it's, it, it's like this train just going, you know, across a continent and then it just hits the ocean. And then once it's in the ocean, it's like, you know, it's, it's like it's made of salt and it just dissolves into the ocean. And, and you don't want to go back to the land, you know? <laughs> it's like just no interest. It, it feels like clunky, clumsy and weird to try to go back to that, you know? And, and, and I thought of another analogy yesterday that, you know, is a little odd, but I also think it's a little bit like, like a porno where, you know, like this, or like older, yeah, por you know, the idea of like um, the pizza guy and the whole setup, but people really just want, you know, the sex or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, uh, this reminds me, this is many, many years ago. I was, I was, you know, in my like club going days in New York and um, um, someone had made um, uh, this video uh, and it was shown in a club of like um, all the scenes before the sex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like the pizza guy showing up and then the plumber <laughs> showing up. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a scene in The Big Lebowski like that, where like I, I, one of the characters, one of those nihilists or something, he's at, the dude is at Julianne Moore's like apartment or whatever, and she's showing him this video and it, he just, yeah, he just sees that part of it. And it's, it's hilarious. It's, it's perfect for a Coen Brothers movie because it's just so absurd the awkwardness, the clunkiness of it. And, and, that's, and that is kind of similar to how it feels. Like I was interviewing this guy from the Netherlands, Walter, who's actually writing a book um, detailing four years out of decades of his life, which I'm sure he has stories throughout his life. He's a really great storyteller from what he shares online. And he's sharing the four years he spent in Paris in the late 60s when, when he was in his 20s. 
And, and in the interview with him, I was asking him, well, was there anything, were there any experiences around that time that reminded you of the way you perceive things now? And he said, no, not at all. So I was like, okay, well, I guess we don't need to talk about it. You know, it's, it just, it felt weird. I didn't, you know, he has stories with like Jim, where he met Jimi Hendrix and all these interesting, and he took LSD and all these interesting, you know, Notre Dame and all these interesting things. But um, yeah, that's, I guess, somehow that's less interesting than talking about nothing. Talking about? Nothing. Yeah. D right now, for me. For the moment. Yeah. yeah, and that could change. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it's, I'm not approaching it that way with, yeah, I mean, if somebody really is, a, it could go anywhere, and I'm open to that. Yeah, yeah, and like, a, you know, when, when we did that uh, podcast with, with Sharon and Nick, mm -hmm. it was, it was great fun. It was just, I, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed listening to it, because I remembered all these experiences and you know it was it was again kind of like looking at photos of your picture of your trip to Europe it's like yeah. oh yeah I remember that yeah. oh yeah but you know other people uh weren't there so you know why why would they want to listen to that <laughs> well, yeah some might and some might not, but yeah, it, it's really how you feel. You know what you feel is interesting. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. The, the interesting thing is that I actually enjoy other people talking about that stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I wanna hear about their experiences. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times um, I, I think, oh yeah, I, I, I felt that. And, uh, and, you know, the, people talk about things and um, I, I've had similar experiences. So when, when that comes up, I, I, I totally can relate to that. Yeah. So I, I think that there is a lot of value to, to, to people when they hear about it because they, they feel connected. Yeah, there, there's a connection there. Yeah. Um, but there's also, of course, there's that danger that people think, oh, it's 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 it has to be this way, or um, oh, you know, that's that was the wrong experience. Right. Uh, yeah. The, the, this very quickly a judgment comes in as far as yeah, right or wrong experience, or let's say to someone who's very new to this, you know, they're going to perceive anyone who talks about any experience just about as an authority of some, to some degree, you know, because they're a little further along the apparent path of whatever. So like, oh, I haven't had that happen yet. That sounds interesting. I guess I need to do that then. I guess, you know, I guess that's step one to get to wherever they are in step 27, I mean, or step infinity, you know, I mean, <laughs> so it's, it, yeah. I, yeah. Or, or, uh, darn, that happened to them. Why couldn't it happen to me? Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, th there was this one guest on Buddha the Gas Pump who I really, he said something I, I, that really stuck with me about that, where he, because he said he had a lot of experiences um, for like a couple years. And then I guess he took. A, you know, a certain dose of mushrooms and then had the final thing and then it all just went away or whatever. And he stopped taking mushrooms and stopped having experiences or whatever of that kind. Um, but what he said was he view, he said experiences could be viewed from another light as sort of like training wheels, you know? It's like, it's not necessarily necessary, but for some people it it, it is, but it's something you're gonna have to let go of. It's, you know, and and it's something that ultimately can become a burden because no matter how hard you try, when there is an experience, it's impossible for the body mind to not want more of it if it was pleasurable. You know, and a lot of these experiences people talk about, you know, are, can be incredibly pleasurable.
you know, on the, on the relative level, even though it's, that's not what it's ultimately about. Uh, yeah, I agree. And um, there, if you think about it, what's the difference between having a spiritual experience from say uh, jumping out of an airplane or uh, um, you know any of those uh, other extreme things that people chase sometimes and uh, I think that there is uh, for some people um, um, a need for some reason to, to have these big experiences. Um, and um, um, I, again, I think some of it has to do with personality types. Yeah. Uh, um, I remember some uh, a person that I knew kind of um, poo pooed uh, my very uh, um, risk adverse lifestyle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, this person is always doing all kinds of risky things in their life. And um, um, and apparently that's what they need to do, but uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with living a quiet, uh, um, unremarkable life either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and something many people listening might be thinking, and some might say in response to that is, that there's, you know, the question, is there any choice in this, you know, in, in your character and one person may be wired to be um, high risk taking and sort of an adrenaline junkie almost an experience, you know, junkie. Another person might prefer to just have a yeah, quiet, simple life. And one doesn't have to be better than the other or more correct. They both are just, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of answering the question, but I mean, or it's not even a question, but it's just a, yeah, I think that's the general non-dual perspective on that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I, I totally feel that there is no choice. Uh, right, and I say non-dual perspective, but it's also increasingly the neuroscience perspective where people think they're making a decision and then these brain scans show that somehow the decision was made seven, up seven or 10 seconds earlier and they didn't even realize. Yeah, yeah. And of course, if you take into consideration their conditioning, their uh, genetics, uh, what led to this human being the way they are right now, uh, there was no choice. And uh, the, the, the personality is not something that we choose. Uh, I don't think anyone chooses anything. Um, there isn't like, you know, a little, a little, someone inside your head that says, oh, I'll choose uh, to have that kind of personality instead of that kind of personality. Right. Um, yeah, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and who, and who knows what our science fiction-esque future may hold. I mean, you know, there there is um, like Ray Kurzweil, this famous futurist guy, predicted a lot of things that have come true. He, he has this idea that um, at some point, 
once the brain is totally understood and basically scannable, that people should be able to upload their entire central nervous system experience and other people will be able to download it and sort of have a little brief glimpse of what it's literally like to be in someone else's shoes. So who knows? Who knows? It might be yeah. interesting, but, but even then, what would that change? You know, I mean, I, actually, I mean, to be honest, me as a character, I think that could be a very beautiful tool to help bring more empathy to people with different lives and different, I think that could do, go a long way to help bring more empathy throughout humanity for people who, you know, seem to not be able to um, have that for each other easily. And yet, you know, something you said earlier about the kibbutz. Oh, all right, I'm, I just hit record again. Yeah, I, inter, yeah, my connection just went out for a second, but I was just saying when you were talking about the kibbutz and um, you were, I think the way you were saying it was that changing this um, structure could be helpful, but if there isn't an emotional change, I think, is that what you were saying? Which? Uh, I, I was saying that um, people can have uh, very good ideas, uh, but uh, if emotionally uh, they are somewhere else, um, it won't come out the way that it was intended. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, I mean, Ramana Maharshi went as far to say that even a good deed is not valuable if it isn't done for the right reasons, which is interesting because I don't even know if I agree with that because I think, you know, if, if some, let's say if some wealthy, you know, sociopath, um, you know, or some, some wealthy person who made their money off of being predatory in some way, right? Um, which is not all wealthy people, I'm not suggesting that, but someone like that, um, and then they, let's say, donate a million or a hundred million dollars purely for the PR aspect, purely to be perceived as a good guy. They do something that winds up saving millions of lives or helping millions of lives. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that's good. But, but then that's just my character. And I, and I guess, and, and Ramana, I think, was getting to something much deeper when he said that. But the point, I guess the point I was trying to actually get to with this is, um, you know, the idea that the world is ever going to be in perfect balance is sort of like a carrot on a stick in itself. You know, that, you know, I, we should all, I mean, I, I believe we should always do what we can to help you know, make the world a better place because of our presence, you know, basically. Um, do what we can to help. Th that's, that's my opinion, but I don't expect anything out of it. You know, it's like, well, that's the thing with like, it's in the Gita and Gandhi said that. He said, be the change you wanna see in the world. But the other half of that quote that's not so often mentioned, and it all just goes from, comes from the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, is where it's be the change you want to see in the world, but don't expect any particular outcome. You know, sort of non-attachment to the outcome. You know, and um, it, and the other point I think about is, you know, every solution to a problem always brings new problems. There's never a perfect solution. It's always an ebb and flow. Yeah, and I think that came up in the, the meeting before, and I'm going to uh, kind of repeat what I said, which is, um, I, I don't know what, what is the right thing to do a lot of times. Uh, well, always. Um, I, I try. Yeah. But, um, I don't think that it's possible to 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 know what is the right thing to do. Uh, 
and um, it doesn't mean not doing anything if, if it seems like the right thing to do. But I, I think that um, sometimes uh, the, the worst people uh, say in higher office uh, will bring about a change as a reaction to how terrible they were, for example. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they were intending one thing, but the result was something else, for example. So, uh, you know, we're not going to get into politics, but... Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes uh, someone who uh, uh, has very uh, uh, selfish intentions will um, will bring about good results to the country, let's say, or the planet uh, by. Um, exposing thir certain aspects right. of government. Right. Uh, so, and, and vice versa, sometimes people with very good intentions um, will, um, uh, in the long run, uh, delay processes uh, that uh, need to happen or um, um, yeah yeah just just uh, yeah or or it might keep it keep people complacent and like you were saying something might be ex some kind of darkness could be exposed that causes a proper response or a, let's say a response that leads to some better outcome where if there's something kind of more positive or neutral that negative thing underneath the surface never gets exposed or is delayed. Yeah. And, and yeah, everything you're saying it, I mean, well, this reminds me of the Zen saying this, this beautiful story. I, I, I think about quite often of, you know, the, the guy who is the poor farmer that has one horse and the horse runs away. And then the neighbor says, Oh, what misfortune you lost your only horse. And he said, we'll see. And then the next day, the horse comes back with three other horses and he says, wow, what good fortune. Now you have four horses. And the neighbor, neighbor says, and the farmer says, we'll see. And then the next day or a week later, um, the farmer's son is riding one of these new horses who's wild and he falls off and breaks his leg. And the neighbor says, you know, what misfortune again? And he says, we'll see. And then a week or two later, the country goes to war and, and his son would have had to go to war and probably would have died, but now he doesn't. And then the neighbor says, what good fortune? And he says, we'll see. And it's, there's no end to the story. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> And yet we all do have opinions as characters and have certain things we feel motivated to do or not do based out of our sense of what we think is right or wrong. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, and that, that sort of just does itself. It, it, it has its own beauty. It, 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 I don't want to say it needs to be honored, but I think, you know, worrying too much about if you're right or wrong about it you know, well, I don't know. I, yeah, I can't say anything. I, now I'm, I, I'm getting what you said completely. The, what you were getting at there when you're saying you don't know what's really going to bring about help. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think, you know, listening and um, trying to be respectful to other people and um, being trying to be open, trying to be aware of who we are. Um, 
That's all we can do. Yeah. 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 And and I feel like there is this, yeah, it's that loosening of the grip and things just flow better. It's like taking the, you know, something that was blocking the water from flowing down the mountain. You know, it was getting, it was, the water was building up and splashing around in weird ways. And now it's just flowing wherever it flows. Yeah. Yeah. Are we, um, feels like we're winding down. I'd, I mean, say, I'd say so. Yeah. 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 So, um, is there anything that you want to promote? Um, no. or add? No. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> no, I, I, and, and this is, you know, again, totally the character thing, mm -hmm. but that I, I have a, a real aversion to, to like people promoting and selling and, um, yeah. You know, I wrote this book, I have this whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's just not, not my thing at all. 